We have a star-spangled panel. Joining me is Ben Domenech. Domenech. Did I get that right, Ben? I want to get that right. Domenech. You did. Second time around. <laughs> You're the smartest guy in the world. I want to get your rate name right. Thank you for coming on. Ben is the editor-at-large at The Spectator. We thank him. And first-time guest, we welcome Caroline Downey, National Review reporter. And we welcome Jason Chaffetz, the smartest guy in the building, former Utah congressman, chair of the House Oversight Committee and Fox News contributor, and author of The Puppeteers, a very good book. All right, kids, I want to begin uh, with this clip from Donald Trump about New Hampshire and Nikki Haley and get you to weigh in on it. Here it comes. The people behind Nikki Haley are pro-amnesty, they're pro-China, they're pro-open borders. You know, she wants open borders, don't kid yourself. Pro-war, and they're pro-Biden, because those are the people that are sending them. Biden people are coming in, they have Biden stuff, and they're coming in to register and to, to vote in your primary. It is crazy. All right, now, I don't know if all that's true, but some of it's certainly true, and I want to get your uh, take on it. And Caroline, I want to begin with you. Let me just read a poll. Boston Globe poll, 50-34 um, for Trump, so that's plus 16. The St. Anselm's poll, Caroline, which is interesting, 52-38, uh, 14 plus for Trump. But among Republicans, Caroline, it's 65-25 for Trump. Among independents, it's 52-37 for uh, Governor Nikki Haley. What do you make of this? Thanks for having me, Larry. It's true that Haley is flirting with independents and Democrats in a very unique way, but I think it's amazing that she thinks this is a one-on-one -on -one race with Trump right now. She's refusing to accept that she came in third place in Iowa. And frankly, her national message, not as appealing as Trump's. I think her hammering him now is a little bit late to the game. I think she's playing catch-up. Ultimately, what she does is she mostly caters to this kind of fringe foreign policy message that doesn't really resonate with most Americans, well, whereas Trump, his legacy was economic prosperity. And independents and moderates, they remember that. They really do. I mean, Bidenomics has failed astronomically. Nobody's buying it. And at the end of the day, I think people remember that, like you said, there was a booming economy. Now, I mean, credit card debt and household debt are, are soaring. People are mortgaging the future to afford today. Inflation is off the charts. So they're thinking about the economy. It's the economy stupid still holds. And Haley, well, there's a reason why Trump made her U.N. ambassador. No, didn't leave her to domestic affairs. That's uh, why I read off. I mean, we'll get a full report on Biden's speech in North Carolina. But I had to read off a couple of numbers. Uh, we could have gone on. But Biden never speaks the truth about any of this stuff, including this phony, I mean, ultra phony 8% uh, tax rate, where they're using a wealth tax on unrealized capital gains. <laughs> that was never passed. It doesn't exist. Uh, anyway, Ben, uh, so Trump is pounding at Nikki Haley. Um, I don't know if he's going to have an effect or not. Uh, negative ads can work in New Hampshire or not. Let me ask you, Ben, is Trump going to win in New Hampshire as handily as he won in Iowa? I think he will, Larry, and I think there are a couple different dynamics going on here. One is that, you know, the Nikki Haley appeal, I think, uh, really needed to have more investment in it earlier in the process to be able to stand up the kind of uh, national campaign that would be needed to take on the former president. You know, we've seen, I think, an inability on the part of any of these candidates, including even, you know, popular governors like Ron DeSantis, of figuring out a way to go after the former president that doesn't lose you support. Uh, and I think in the case of Nikki Haley, she's been, you know, boosted by a lot of people who won't end up voting for the Republican nominee, whoever that is, uh, come next November. Mm. And then I think, you know, we go on to a more familiar ground for her in South Carolina. And I think that that state could actually deliver an even bigger margin for the former president. Uh, we've seen a real shift in the way that uh, he is viewed by evangelicals, by rural voters, by a lot of other voters who now you know, are uh, firmly ensconced behind him. And I don't think that any of that is something that can be changed by Nikki Haley or by anyone else in the time needed to actually have a real effort to win this nomination away from the former president. I mean, Jason Chaffetz, it's so interesting to me you're a former House member, you're a former committee chair, to see senators, House members, governors all across the country 
uh, endorsing Donald Trump. It's starting to mount in droves. And I, I know that, you know, that doesn't necessarily win primaries, but it does tell you how deep Trump's support is in the Republican Party. Jason, what I'm getting at is I don't think Nikki Haley ever had that kind of depth of support inside the GOP. I mean, the people that have come out, elected officials, very thin, in her own state of South Carolina, very thin, virtually non-existent. I mean, I, I never really understood the basis of her campaign, Jason. Uh, I agree with all that. Uh, I think this race for the nomination is over, quite frankly. I mean, he, he won 98 out of 99 counties, and the one county he lost to Nikki Haley was by one vote. So uh, give me a break. I, th this race is over, in, and Donald Trump is the presumptive nominee. I think Ron DeSantis in 2028 has a great shot at being the nominee. But for right now, in 2024, going into it, it's going to be Donald Trump. And the sooner Republicans get behind him and make that happen, the more we can focus on, uh, on Joe Biden. Who's going to be his vice president, Jason? Easy question. Um, there, are, there, there's a, there's a couple key positions, and one of them is vice president. I happen to think that Robert O'Brien. Uh, is probably one of the leaders there, as well as John Ratcliffe. I think the, the president is very familiar with both of them. I think this election is about security, security in your wallet, security in the border, security overseas. Both Robert O'Brien and John Ratcliffe have the relationship with the president, as you know. Um, they have daily contact throughout the administration, and they have strong resumes to run circles around Kamala Harris. I, my money would be on Robert O'Brien and John Radcliffe. How about Mike Pompeo, just to follow up on that? Oh, he's certainly a top-tier uh, candidate. The president trusts him and likes him. Uh, you know, Mike Pompeo was flirting with running for president. Uh, and he didn't do that. He, you know, comes from an important state like Kansas. Uh, he'd be an exceptional candidate as well. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the qualifications. I just I want to pitch this uh, uh, to our uh, to our youngest member, Caroline. What do you think about the vice presidential story for Trump? Well, I should withhold any expert analysis as that question is still unfolding. I always thought of the vice presidential pick as someone who is in. The intention there is to capture a demographic that you couldn't on your own. So Pompeo, I, I'm sympathetic with Pompeo, Larry, just because he was in my brother's West Point class. <laughs> he was valedictorian. He was valedictorian. Yes. I think that's that says a lot alone. But I could tell you who the pick will not be. It will not be Nikki Haley. Right, Ben, you agree with that? It won't be <laughs> Nikki Haley, but it might be one of these foreign policy people that uh, Jason Chaffetz is talking about. I think you are underrating the potential of, of someone who I think actually could check a lot of boxes and be extremely competitive when it comes to uh, winning over a demographic that a lot of Republicans would like to pursue. Uh, I think Senator Tim Scott is someone who should be higher mm. in this conversation. Wow. Checks a lot of boxes. And for Republicans who understand that winning just a small portion of the black vote in America would be devastating to Democrats' chances, I think he's someone who, you know, has shown his ability to argue and to take on the left when it comes to their racialization of politics in America uh, in a way that is really inspiring. And I, and I don't think that he's someone uh, who would really rock the boat by being uh, too ambitious on their own right, which is one of the reasons why I think it won't be Nikki. Well, Tim Scott is a great patriot. He's also, I might add, a free market yeah. supply sider. He's a growth guy. Speaking of growth, let me play another sound uh, from... President Trump campaigning in New Hampshire. Take a listen. As soon as I get back in the White House, I will quickly end Joe Biden's inflation catastrophe. We will stop his wasteful spending. We will terminate his Green New Scam. And we will, as I said, drill, baby, drill. We're going to drill, baby, drill. While Joe Biden is pushing the largest tax hike in American history, which he is, I will make the Trump tax cuts the largest ever, larger than Reagan's. I'm going to make them permanent. We have to make them permanent. You know, Caroline Downey, I want to say, uh, in, in my view, and I've been saying this pretty much all year, the biggest reason that Mr. Trump has had such a successful campaign, you know, in the polls, now voting and so forth, he has been on message, on message with the border, which is a signature issue for him going back to 2015, but on message on the economy, drill, baby, drill, liquid gold, tax cuts, deregulation, economic growth. 
He stayed on message. Nikki Haley never had a good economic message. Uh, neither did Governor DeSantis. Neither did any of them. It was Trump on the issues, Caroline. What do you think about that? Like I said, his administration's legacy is financial security and thriving. Even the CEO of J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon, mm. an old-school liberal, has recognized this. When you take away the fear-mongering around Trump's rhetoric on some of these touchy cultural issues, the economic message is overwhelmingly powerful to independents, to moderates, to Democrats, to Republicans alike. Again, right now, for my generation especially, I mean, we... Home ownership is out of the question because of the interest rates right now. Credit card debt is soaring. We are mortgaging the future to afford today. And I, I think, unfortunately, that is such a lived memory for so many of us, what the Trump administration was like. It was, it was prosperous, but it was also, mm. it was stable. You know, Ben, I'm going to give you the last word, but I, my thought here, and I don't mean to demean the others, they're good Republicans. I mean, that's not my point, to go negative. But... None of them running, not a single one of them, had the clear economic message that Donald Trump had. For that matter, Ben, I would add, uh, on the border as well, and you could even go into foreign policy, but particularly on the economy, uh, which remains either the number one or the tied with border security number one. Nobody had a message the way Trump had, and I think it's the most overlooked part of his campaign. Give you the last word, Ben Domenech. I, I just think that one of the things that you're you're talking about there that's so important is that, you know, people really spoke, I think, to a lot of different issues that were too online, that were too uh, trendy, mm. that were things that were perhaps, you know, percolating up within various corners of conservative media and the like, without speaking to those central issues that are clearly dominant and front of mind for so many Americans, not just Republican voters, but independents as well, that we have a catastrophe on the border, that we have an economy that isn't working for Americans the way that it ought to be. Uh, and the fact that we had that level of disconnect, I think, is one of the reasons why this uh, primary contest, such as it was, is coming to an end so quickly. All right. Ben Domenech, thank you. Caroline Downey, thank you. Jason Chaffetz, thanks ever so much.